Hey, what's up, guys? We are the Airtime Misfits, and you're listening to the Airtime Misfits podcast, episode seven. Seven, uh, yeah. Yep. I'm your host, Adam, alongside our co-host, Nick. What's up, guys? So today, we're going to take your ears, and we're going to transport them to another world. Ooh, and that <laughs> other world is the elusive land of Alaska. <laughs> That's right. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about disaster transport located at Cedar Point. So stick around. Disaster transport at Cedar Point. Um, if you are somebody like Adam and myself, um, we're old dudes. This is an old coaster. Uh, yes. you, you've been to Cedar Point and you have ridden this uh, uh, a confusing roller coaster. Debatably <laughs> yeah. the most confusing roller coaster of our time. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, uh, disaster transport was originally known as Avalanche Run. And that opened on May 11th, 1985. So right at the beginning of this season there. There were a couple of oversights, to say the least. For those that don't know or hadn't been to Cedar Point when this ride was up, Disaster Transport is where Gatekeeper is now, or it was where Gatekeeper is now, I should say. And so just to kind of give you an idea, Gatekeeper is right on the water, kind of around the water. And so you had this, you know, Intamin Swiss bobsled right on the uh, shore of Lake Erie. So you can imagine any time you know, uh, a gust of wind would come in <laughs> yeah. or any some any sort of movement in the weather. This open track is just going to get, you know, obliterated with uh, lake water, sand, you name it. Yeah. Um, so it only takes them five years. So 85 and in, in, in 1989, they announced, OK, we're going to put an enclosure around this coaster to prevent any of that mess continuing. Yeah. And then along with that came a new name, as we know, Disaster Transport, and uh, a brand new re-theming. And boy, were they really shooting for the stars, no pun intended, hey, with the zing. re-theming. <laughs> <Yeah>. Zing. <laughs> they, they, uh, they tried to go full-on Disneyland with this thing, and it was a mess. <laughs> it was, <laughs> To yeah. say the least. I don't know if it's just something they didn't consider with Avalanche Run with the uh, weather conditions being right on the beach there. But yeah, it, it suffered a lot of shutdown time because anytime they had to clear sand from the track or mm-hmm. water that collected, yeah, it was a big issue. So I imagine that they didn't think that within four or five years that they would have to like completely rethink the coaster, right? Uh, you know, by enclosing it. And yeah, I think to your point, at the time they were. The idea of the space theme was to compete with Space Mountain at yep. Disney World and Disneyland. Sure was. So it, it was, it never reached the level of Disney theming, obviously, but I probably wrote it the first year's open in 1990 or, or pretty quick there after like 91 or 92. And I think it was only the first few years that like the full theming was working in an effect because I think pretty much which was the case for a lot of Cedar fair rides. Once the theming like either broke or went out, they kind of never really fixed it. Yeah. So you you really only got the full vision of what disaster transport was supposed to be. Like the, if you were able to write the first few years. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, back in those days, the theming was really quite impressive. And, and, you know, to build avalanche run, it was $3.4 million, which is, you know, in 1985, that's a pretty pretty good chunk of change yeah, for what it, it was. It was um, yeah, actually that's more than what I was expecting it to be. Yeah, for a yeah. Coaster, yeah. Right, but then in 1990 to renovate it, it was four million. So it costs more to renovate it than it did to build it. <laughs> right, and, <laughs> and and along with that renovation was uh, Dick Kinzel's grand attempt at theming a coaster for the first time in his <laughs> life. And, right, and they had no clue where to go with it, and kind of the storyline of disaster transport uh it, it 
kind of evolved over time because certain aspects of the theming would either break and they would have to scrap it, such as Disaster <laughs> Dan, right? Right. Everyone remembers Disaster uh, or Disaster Dave, right? Yeah, Disaster Dave. Dave. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it was only around for a year or two, you know, 1990, 1991, maybe. And then it was gone. And so this original, like, spacey theme and, and then it, you know, they're like, oh, well, we got to scrap the space idea so let's make it about alaska and you'd get off i remember my first time writing this in 99 and getting off and the the ride up said welcome to alaska yeah and for those who don't know i i i was born in alaska so you know <laughs> me being six years old i was like what the hell no like <laughs> we're not in alaska this is nothing yeah. like alaska so well, yeah i think the the whole theme of, of the ride i thought it was always originally like a space and alaska based. yeah somehow. it was like this weird crossover of like i don't know how they in yeah. their minds they justified yeah let's make it spacey and alaska yeah like <laughs> so a- according to wikipedia the story of the ride was the passengers had been enlisted to deliver cargo from a suborbital factory to a station in alaska yeah so and then along with that theming the queue which honestly like especially later on uh into the like late 2000s disaster transport obviously wasn't one of the most popular rides because cedar point was like constantly adding all these new record-breaking coasters oh but yeah one of, the, one of the things that disaster transport did have going for it was the queue was all completely indoors so yes. if it was a hot summer day disaster transport was a nice chance to get like a break from the sun absolutely and and i remember when i would do my route uh, at cedar point growing up you know we'd always like at four o'clock when it was the most hot we would go <laughs> yeah. to disaster transport for no other reason other than to just cool off i mean right. the the ride itself was was pretty um it was fun but you know you, yeah. you really went for the the break from the sun and it's yeah. funny and i and i know you've noticed this too adam this was this has by far been our most requested episode oh people, yeah it is people love disaster transport yeah and and i think it's a combination of things it's number one you know people remember those fond memories of oh man you know i got to go cool off in the sun and you know it wasn't the most thrilling ride ever but it was like the saving grace on a hot summer's day and you also had your your, your camp or your group of people who loved the ride because of its confusing themey kind of element. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you're a lot of your Disney fans really gravitated toward disaster transport because again, mm-hmm. Cedar fair is not necessarily known for theming their rides. So no, this was a, no. this was a, you know, this was a pretty, it was a humdinger for a few years. Really. <laughs> it was. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, and, and you got, I think you have your group of people that are just attracted to the idea that, you know, once new management came, uh, the, the first order of business was to scrap this thing and put <laughs> something was. new in. Like, and right. so people kind of have this longing for it. Like, oh man, it was weird, but it was quirky and it was our right. thing growing up. And so, you know, I think a lot of people are attracted to it for many different reasons. Yeah, I, I'm definitely like being a kid of the late 80s, early 90s. Like, I really, I have strong nostalgic feelings and thoughts about Zesta Transport. Yeah, uh, it was never my favorite coaster. And I didn't really fully appreciate it until, you know, near the end of its life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I do have really great memories of that ride. And I always thought it was a fun ride, but it always felt a little bit short. Yeah. Uh, But I really like the space theming. And what I was going to say is, so when you entered the the line, there was three different rooms that you walked through in the queue. Yeah. And, And originally it was really impressive. But, you know, as the years went on, like as theming deteriorated and they didn't replace anything it just kind of became like a a warehouse with like black light paint on the walls and stuff and it was like laser tag (laughs) right exactly like a laser tag room (laughs) yeah the three rooms though uh each had a theme the first room was called rocket recovery and that i believe is where you would see dave he was in the rocket recovery room i believe and he was like a rocket locator robot yeah he was only fully functional for the first few years and then i think he just ended up becoming just sort of like a a standstill robot like didn't move at all and then eventually it was removed altogether and then the next room that you would enter through is called michigan control uh and then the final room was the repair bay and i think that's where the other robot named frank was frank okay yeah i remember his name yeah he was like a robotic foreman uh, yeah 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 yeah. Uh uh-huh 
uh, yeah, so that was the three rooms. And then you uh, finally made the way your way to the launch area, which is where you board the train. And then uh, you proceed to go up to Lift Hill. And the Lift Hill was pretty cool because uh, it was completely surrounded by like blinking lights. And then you reach the top and then you drop down to like this pitch black hill. Like it was, I think, yeah, I have the stats here. So the, the height of the first drop is 63 feet. Um, well, the drop is 50 feet. The height of the hill is 63 feet. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, you reach a top speed of 40 miles an hour. So if you imagine, you know, dropping 50 feet and going 40 miles an hour in pitch black, it's a pretty cool feeling. It is. I, you know, honestly, I, obviously I I never saw disaster transport as the most thrilling coaster by any means um, (laughs) at Cedar point. Um, But yeah, that, that, that plummet almost, I mean, it's, it's gradual. It's a bobsled. So you're kind of swaying side to side, but like that, that, that decline was really interesting. It was kind of thrilling, like in a way, I mean, it was, it's pitch black. You don't really see anything um on, on one of the helices like midway through the ride i remember circling over like uh as like a like a spaceship or yeah like yep. some sort of weird unidentifiable um spacey right. thing in yeah. the middle of the track which was, i thought was really cool because you kind of just circled around it yeah um yeah but- i was gonna say yeah a, a lot of the ride was pitch black but every once in a while you would get some glimpses of some theming on the ride like yeah you're, like you're talking about that big spaceship thing that you do a helix around yeah and then there's a little bit of other light theming so when you weren't in pitch black there was some like kind of cool black light type of effects and theming yeah yeah absolutely and and i remember being a kid just thinking you know i i, I guess at that point I, I never really thought about like terms of theming and things like that. Right. You know, I, I just remember thinking, wow, this is so different than anything else Cedar Point yeah. has to offer. And it was really, it was really cool in that regard to me. Um, I never raced to like wait in line on it because I know, <laughs> right. I, I mean, in those hot July days, that line could be longer than it should have ever been. Oh, so oh, absolutely. It, yeah. it, it was brutal. I, and at though toward the end of its life, like you were saying, I never really appreciated it uh, until the, toward the end of its life, but I think the only time I was like, man, you know what? I'll wait in this line. Uh, it was so long. Was it's last year? Uh, but yeah, the theming was super cool. And then you had the whole 3D era where they were like, oh crap, everything's kind of deteriorating in this building. <laughs> right. Let's make it, let's make it 3D. Well, right. we could charge a little money and oh, yeah, because um, they them sold, a new experience. Yeah, because when you entered the queue, uh, you had the option of purchasing 3D glasses if you mm-hmm. want. I think they were a couple bucks, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but seen, yeah, <laughs> I've seen them go on eBay for like. A good chunk of change. Yeah. So that's I, if you have those, that's a relic right there. Yeah. I, I actually do have a pair. Oh yeah, you do. Yes, I do. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah, that but that, that was uh for Cedar Fair and Cedar Point, that was like kind of the cheapest solution for them to kind of keep up on some sort of theming was to uh yeah, sell these three D glasses and then like hang up three D posters on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Which added to the laser uh tag kind of like effect that it's right. going on, you know. Right, because I don't I can't remember. Were you supposed to wear the glasses during the ride as well? I don't think so. I don't think that I, they. I, I don't think it was remember just for the queue. Yeah, I, I feel like it was mostly for the queue. I'm sure they didn't really like explain that thoroughly, so that you would wear it and convince yourself it was a 3D ride. <laughs> right. right. But, you know, that's how they justify it. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was just for the queue. I never did buy them. I was like, this is kind of dumb. Yeah. I want to pay for you know walking through a line. So <laughs> right. like. Uh, it is funny though, because that ride, like even towards the end, it was never the most popular coaster. But you were right though; it seems like the queue was always long, and you never really realized how long it was until you got inside. Because, yeah, because <laughs> it's like see... flight of fear, right? Kings exactly. Island. You know, you, like, you 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 like I've reached the point at flight of fear where, uh, like, I'll I'll go and ask the the guy working the entrance. I'll say, "Look, how long is this thing going to be?" And <laughs> right. and I wish I could have done that. I wish there was someone out there all the time at disaster transport because there'd be times I'd walk in and get you get to the second room and you're like nah (laughs) right yeah i'm I'm not doing this it's not worth it yeah and uh, another thing about disaster transport i think it was a really good kind of mid-tier thrill coaster so it was really good for kind of younger kids who are just starting to get into coasters absolutely and i think that's yeah that's another reason why i liked it so much because when i was younger i was sort of afraid of coasters and disaster Mm -hmm. transport was a good starter coaster for me yeah absolutely i agree there was a period of time where you know i wasn't sure 
how I felt about coasters. You know, I wasn't ever going for the big one or anything like that, right. but I remember really gravitating toward disaster transport because, um, again, it was just that different theme experience. And I thought that was really cool. And I also did see it as like a mid tier thrill that, you know, I could enjoy and yeah. not be scared of. So I think it was definitely a, a highly respected coaster for that reason. Cause Cedar point really hasn't focused on that type of coaster ever since, you know, no. it's always been the biggest, baddest, fastest, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'd really argue, and I don't want to go too much down a rabbit hole because we have these tough conversations a lot, but <laughs> they really could use another mid thrill level coaster. Absolutely. Um, I think that's that, what the park is missing the most. That, yeah. Big time, big time. And, and really, uh, honestly, at the, at the time, what you had wildcat, you had mm -hmm. corkscrew, you had, uh, i guess jim and i and you had disaster right. transport no outside blue of streak, that right yeah, blue streak mine right but yeah. like you know they haven't had a good modern mid-tier like thrill coaster in a while no i agree i think the two things that the park could use the most is a, a good mid-tier thrill coaster for the whole family yes and then also a good quality dark ride absolutely and disaster transport fit both of those bills it absolutely did yeah it did so i think the main reason why they decided to move the ride ultimately was because it was such an eyesore at the park mm -hmm. it was. uh and they wanted to free up the view of lake erie because for a lot of time like through the 90s and early 2000s like that whole side of the park where now gatekeeper is and wicked twister and the ferris wheel a lot of that was blocked like you yeah. couldn't see much of lake erie mm -hmm. uh, so removing disaster transport not only freed up room for a new coaster, but the, uh, like open up a view of Lake Erie so they could take advantage of being on a lake. Right. Even though I, I don't think Disaster Transport suffered from any like mechanical issues. Uh, I did read though that even when the coaster was finally like enclosed in a building that it still suffered from rain collecting on the track. So anytime it rained, mm -hmm. water would still leak inside of the, the building and collect in the track. It would. And I remember... You know, I, I think they tried to combat that by like sealing the different cracks that might have come up over time. And, you know, it was just too much to keep up with. Right. Um, so, you know, there were really a, a few key reasons why I think, you know, with the new management, they said, look, this is the first thing we got to get out of here. Um, <laughs> right. it, it, you know, number one was the upkeep. Uh, yep. It was it was a pain to keep identifying leaks and shutting it down mm -hmm. because the more it shut down, the less ridership it has, the less value it has. Number two, I think it was just outdated and confusing. And it yeah. was the coaster that you would only go to because it was air conditioned during the hot summer. <laughs> right. Like it, it was just, it was time for uh, some innovation at yes. Cedar Point. Like they yep. needed something updated in that space because it's prime real estate. It's at the front of the park. Mm -hmm. the first thing you see. Um, and so that's why I think Gatekeeper was like a really genius idea to call yeah. it that, to have it go over the gate it made sense. Like it, it was just the right move, I think, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, ultimately I think, you know, the biggest reason why they got rid of it though was, I don't know. I think it had just, you know, there are just certain coasters that have just served their time and yeah. it's time to go. Absolutely. There's no, there's no major issues with it. It's just time to go. It's time yeah. for something else. So well, yes, uh, that's especially the case for the bobsled coaster model because yeah. there's not, not a lot of those left in north america that i, I can, know of i can think of three there's the one at great escape there's the one at uh six flags Kings over dominion texas. and six flags over texas yeah and Kings yeah. dominion has the other one so yeah it's, it's a dying model i think they're kind of cool but i don't you know i, I don't really see them hanging around a whole lot longer just I mean, intimate alone, if, if you're going to get an intimate coaster, you're certainly not going to go for the bobsled anymore. You know, no, like I doubt they have so much. I'm else. assuming that they're not offering the bobsled coaster model anymore either. I'm, I'm going to bet not. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they would make it for you if you paid yeah. them. But, you yeah. know, we do have some commercials here that we can play. Yes, so and these are these are great. commercials. Oh, yeah. I, I love all the 80s commercials. And yes. these are, you know, no disappointment at all. So I have um, three here. The first one I'm going to play is a radio spot that you'd hear for disaster transport. And this would have played in 1990 or, you know, the right around there. Yeah. yeah the probably the winter and spring leading up to the, the summer mm -hmm. of 1990. So let's check it out. There's a world apart, a place in your heart. Can't you hear it calling you? 
summer neighborhood. Mayday! 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 This is Dispatch Master for oh, wow. Transport! Yeah. <laughs> It is pretty clever theming. It, it really is. Yeah. I mean, this commercial anyway. Oh, yeah. Disaster transport. It'll oh, man. Out of this world. But it, it just got seductive back. with that voice. <laughs> <laughs> disaster transport <Yeah. laughs> you're gonna like the way it rides i yeah. guarantee it it's like the men's warehouse guy <laughs> oh it does yeah <laughs> he was doing yeah a lot of voiceover work back then uh, oh yeah. yeah that was something i forgot to mention too so the the name disaster transport comes from the phrase dispatch master transport right yeah so in versions of the disaster transport logo you can see where it says dispatch master transport but they have like parts of the word like kind of broken off so it forms the word disaster transport. disaster yeah, yeah. Yep. which is pretty clever it is yeah that was, that was kind of clever theming for its time yeah and before so that what i just played was something that you would have heard on the radio the tagline on that was disaster transport. It'll take you out of this world or something like that. Uh -huh. So that was the tagline in the radio, but in the commercial that we're going to play next, they had a different tagline. It was like, they couldn't decide which one to use. Yep. So, okay. So uh, I'll just set this commercial for you for people who are listening to the podcast and not watching our YouTube version of this podcast. Cause I do play the commercials uh, so you can see what you're hearing, but uh, just to set it up, there's a boy sitting on like the steps of his house and there's a dog staring at him and he's bouncing a ball on the ground like he's all bored and it's like a nighttime setting so like the sky is all lit up with stars and stuff and so when i press play you'll hear like a noise of a ball bouncing that's because this boy is bored with nothing to do and here we go Dog's just staring. Next time you get bored with life on Earth. Oh man, I forgot about the, the just random like no setup. It's just just out of his chucks <laughs> he is off <laughs> yeah. well the funny thing is yeah he's just sitting there and then all of a sudden it looks like he farts or something and like he yeah. just blasts off into the sky with this like yeah. trail of smoke coming out of his ass <laughs> but uh so this one the tagline is a scream in space which a is pretty cool space. yeah i don't it, think i ever heard that tagline no ever i don't again think they ever use it no <laughs> no <laughs> A scream in space, and then the radio one was "It's out of this world" or something like that. Yeah, yeah two it's like totally they different not ideas. Decide. Right? Yeah. So they were like, "Oh, we'll just use both." Uh, we'll use another, both. <laughs> another thing that I forgot about that I noticed in this commercial. So obviously, through the decades, Cedar Point has many different logos. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot about this one though. At the end of this video, it shows the yeah. Cedar Point logo. This is the one where. Uh, the letter I and point is upside down, so it looks like an exclamation, exclamation point. point. Yeah, I forgot about that one. I don't think they used that one very long. No, yeah, it must have been, gosh, probably just for that season or two. Um, yeah. Because it was always the amazement park in through yep. the 80s, and I feel like maybe the amazement park made a comeback in the early 90s. Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, this was an interesting rendition of it that you yeah. don't see often. Right. It's still pretty cool, though. I, I like it. All right, and the last commercial I'm going to play is uh, is just a general Cedar Point commercial from 1989 or 1990. It wasn't sure on YouTube. So when this commercial starts, you see a, a picture of a tanning bed and then you hear a voice. The voice is coming is coming from a guy who's laying inside the tanning bed. So keep that in mind. So the person talking is like this tan like surfer bro looking guy oh yeah laying in a tanning bed okay here we go is this your idea of a sunny getaway how about something a little brighter <laughs> before
before you catch the rays, there catch is. this. The Cedar Point well, Family oh, Getaway wow. Guide. How to get the most on America's roller coaster. Getaway savings of up to 150 bucks, and it's free. Call 1 800 Best Fun and make your summer shine. Free? Call 1 800 Best Fun. <laughs> Operators are standing by. So call now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, my. <laughs> It's I like that commercial because it's interesting to see like the different uh, footage that they show from the park in 1990 or 1989. So it's mostly yeah. corkscrew, iron dragon, uh, Gemini footage and then yeah, hotel breakers and that kind of stuff. But then random just, flat rides. Yeah. Yeah. Even the guy, though, laying in the tanning bed in a full suit, mind you. He's not. Yes. Even, <laughs> it's a white what suit. The heck? <laughs> yeah. Cause it, it was 1990. Of course, it was a white suit. So he looks like Miami Vice style yeah but yeah i just thought it was cool but he's talking about the getaway guide man oh man did i love the getaway guide through the 90s uh, like i i still have quite a few of them i don't have every one from the 90s but i have a lot of them but eventually they phased out the getaway guide but i really i always loved and look forward to getting the getaway guide because this was like back before you could you know look on the computer to find out you know what's cedar point doing you really like a lot of times i didn't find out what was going to be new at cedar point until i got the getaway guide yeah, same. I loved the getaway guide. I, I had a number of them for a while, but I yeah. think I probably eventually thrown them away because they were just so worn. But <laughs> right. there was, yeah, I mean, yeah, way back, like even into the early 2000s, yeah. it was the coolest thing to get that in the mail. It, it really was. And I think I know they did one for Millennium Force in 2000. So the getaway guide, if you don't know, it was like a full fledged like magazine, pretty much. Yeah. And it was filled with ads and stuff. But there was a park map in the middle of the magazine. And then always like on the first or second page, it was like a full like write up and pictures of what the new ride or coaster is going to be that year. Mm -hmm. And then there was like, you know, throughout the magazine, there's information about hotels like Hotel Breakers and uh camper village and all sorts of stuff but i think after 2000 they sort of slowly started kind of slimming it down so it almost yeah. became the size of like a brochure Pretty but much. they would still send it to you in the mail and also there it was full of coupons in the back but yeah eventually it got to like the size of a three-page brochure and then eventually they just stopped because you know the internet digital took off. yeah <laughs> right yeah the whole internet thing yeah <laughs> gosh yeah, yeah, but it's too bad. I always love getting that. Oh, I did too. I have so many good memories of, you know, open that up in the mail and man, what a time. Yeah. I I really miss like physical park maps and, oh, and, yeah, and all the too. cool things that you could have as like little, you know, m mementos, I guess. Yeah, from those absolutely. Days. Another fun thing about, about disaster transport. So with the queue being mostly indoors, Cedar fair cedar point did take advantage of that during hollow weekends so yes during hollow weekends they would use a portion of the indoor queue and they would use it as a haunt so the first haunt though was called cedar point cemetery and that was in 1997 i don't have mm -hmm. any memory of cedar point cemetery so i don't know what it was like yeah i don't either um i i do know that um that's when disaster dave made a comeback as oh yes a prop yeah, and it, I don't know if it was the cemetery. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm sure someone will correct me if I well, am. But yeah, it was I, one of those. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I have the list here. I, oh yeah. I, I bet it was the last one here. The second one, which was in 2000, which was called Pharaoh's Secret. It was like an Egyptian themed haunted house, Ooh, which okay. is interesting. I don't remember that one either. I don't either. Yeah. I've never been a huge fan of the haunts, though. I get scared. <laughs> <laughs> you know but, what? I uh, I I just never liked the lines. They're no, so long. I don't like people screaming at me in the dark. Yeah, that's <laughs> fair. That's, there's something about that that's not really... Yeah. Uh, it's pretty unsettling. It is. Uh, but the, the uh, haunted house that you're speaking of, I believe... And this one I actually do have memories of. And I didn't go inside and I kind of regret it. But this one, I, I think a lot of people loved. It was Happy Jack's Toy Factory. Happy Jack. Yeah, which was right. the haunted house that was there in 2009. And I'm assuming it was there until 2012 when they removed the building. But I, bet I think it was. for Happy Jack, I believe that's where you could see Dave and like other, uh, you know, old relics of Cedar Point, uh, old theming and signs and stuff. Uh, I always heard, though, that was a really good haunt and it had some really cool rooms with some, you know, like cool stuff to see. So uh, I wish I went inside there. Yeah, I, I don't I never did that one. And to be honest, I haven't done many of the haunts at Cedar <laughs> Point again, just because I'm like, man, if 
I'm gonna be waiting in line. I might as well just right. go ride something. Yeah. But uh, I, I do remember like seeing pictures of of Happy Jacks, and yeah. I feel like there's just some bizarre stuff in there. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there was a wall of baby dolls peeing yes. on you. Yeah, oh. that's odd. Like that's well, just real weird. They're peeing on you. I think so. Oh, I thought well, I remember. I, or they're like gonna, squirting water or something. I thought it was peeing. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you, that's You might be off. right. I mean, well, they do make dolls that pee. Yeah. I was going to say, like, when you said the baby doll room, that's what I was going to say. Like, I've heard, like, there was a room filled with baby dolls. I didn't know that they, if they were leaking or not. I didn't, see, I didn't hear I, about I, that. I'm going to look but, here. I, I'm going to see if I can find a picture. Um, but I, I have heard, like, that was one of the cool rooms to see in there. It was, like, one filled with baby dolls. Yeah, there was there was all kinds of weird stuff. I only ever saw pictures, but um... and honestly, it seems like you know. I think a lot of people obviously love going to the haunts. It seems like, from what I've read and heard, that most people talk about Happy Jacks like the most fondly of any uh, haunted house that I can think of. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's for sure peeing. Um, oh, it is. <laughs> it for sure is. Yeah. Yeah. Let me yeah. see if I can. <laughs> yeah okay uh, i i'm not, I'm not gonna share my screen waste your time but yeah it's it's definitely peeing okay oh okay <laughs> well, confirmed i'm not that weird <laughs> all right all right guys you heard it first we've confirmed they had peeing yeah, baby dolls th they did yeah yeah so take that up with cedar point <laughs> yeah well that's something yeah uh, <laughs> uh yeah the, and that that building i i feel like you know there was there were all those haunts yeah and it just none of none of disaster transports life toward the end of it made a whole lot of sense and it really only <laughs> no. became a building for haunts and a building for storage and like it you could tell that cedar point was done with it oh um, absolutely one thing though i will so say though that i do respect about cedar point though is that they did announce they announced that disaster transport was closing on july 13th and they let everyone know that you had a final chance to ride. You had two weeks. Your final chance to ride was like July 29th. So if you want to ride it, come ride it. And then we'll say goodbye mm -hmm. to it. And nowadays, a lot of times they, they don't let people know that, you know, we're closing this ride forever. So, you know, come ride it. Now's your chance. I mean, they don't do yeah. that anymore, really. No, so. they really they really don't. And, yeah, uh, you know, Kings Island has been pretty good about that with their recent closings. But, yeah, in general, I, I mean, I remember I was one of the last rides on, on Disaster Transport. And I remember they... Uh, I was not on the last ride or mm -hmm. the last day because I think that was like you had to buy a seat and they yeah. donated the proceeds to charity. Yeah, they did. I believe. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I, I was not a part of that group, but I remember going like the last week or two weeks or whatever it was. And you saw a lot more like people showing up with disaster transport shirts oh, and absolutely. showing out their support. Yeah. And it, was, it was weird because up until like cedar point announced it was closing no one seemed to really care about it in my <laughs> that, mind anyway yeah that that generally seems like it's the case for any coaster that's going to be removed you know it could be something that like everyone complains about but as soon as the park announces that it's leaving then that's when people then get all upset they freak out you're getting their feelings <laughs> right about yeah yeah absolutely yeah. but i do understand it for disaster transport because it was such a unique coaster for that park yeah. and for cedar fair parks in general because other than flight of fear like i can't really think of any coaster that they have is that is at that level of theming yeah no um, not at all yeah so i i can understand why people are upset a couple little fun bits of information before we wrap this up so obviously in the outside of the building there is a huge if you've seen it or seen photos of it there's a huge 12e on the side of the building yes and that's the, probably the most identifiable mark of zest transport was that big 12e and for a long time people didn't know what 12e stood for but in 2005 it was finally revealed that 12e stood for it was the 12th ride that was designed by this guy named eric so 12e and eric worked for iTech productions and that was the company that they brought in to uh, renovate avalanche mm -hmm. run into zest transport so it was just a random number apparently 12e so 12th ride that eric designed so it's not yep, as yeah. cool of a story as you would think it is. Yeah, like, there's it, no yeah, story behind it. <laughs> yeah, people would always kind of speculate. And, yeah, you know, like it's I, some I remember, kind of hidden message or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember being on forums growing yeah. up and like people are like, oh, well, I think it means like they're going to add a 12, like 12 new coasters in the next. You know, there were all sorts, like all sorts of 
different theories. But right. It was really just this dude named Merrick putting his insignia <laughs> on it. Um, so what a boss that's all, move. Yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's all there was to it. You know, I've yeah. seen people have gotten a 12 E tattoo and yeah, honestly, uh, you know, uh, I'll go ahead and do a little plug here. We've, we've made a 12 E enamel pin that we you can have, purchase yes. at airtimemisfits.com. Yeah, and we've just dropped the prices on those too. So yeah, we yeah. are. Uh, for those that ha- have not stayed in touch with us on social media, we made an announcement earlier this week that we are in the process of creating and producing new products. So uh, to uh, to clear out some space, we're doing an inventory reduction sale. So everything in the Airtime Misfits store is ridiculously cheap right now uh, because we have very limited amounts of everything left so if you see anything like the disaster transport pin or the son of beast pin or any of our candles or a shirt or what have you yeah um they're all dirt cheap right now because we are making new stuff for you to enjoy and it's uh it's it's time to clear out some space so that i have some room to store everything so that's right. And once they're gone, they're gone. So yeah, we plan that's making those again. So yeah, that that'll be that. So you don't mm-hmm. want to sleep on it. Um, yeah. And there's there, there's no promo code necessary. Uh, we've yeah. applied the discount and uh, that that will be active until everything's gone. So yes, don't don't sleep on it. No, definitely check that out. Also, on a closing note, before we end this, a bit of uh, fun news for any of you that do love disaster transport. Uh, Nick and I did go to winter chill out last yes. weekend. We did. And we were talking to one of the engineer mechanic guys inside of the animation shop. He uh, informed us that you'll be able to see Disaster Dave in the newly renovated Town Hall Museum at Cedar Point. So yes. th- they've uh, they broke it down and like cleaned it up and got it rewired and all fixed up. So it's going to be back and fully functional. Yep, sure will. And uh, that... I believe he, he made every indication that that will be e- even this year. So yeah. I know COVID's kind of suspended a lot of what Cedar Points wanted to do, but he made it sound like that whole town hall area might be as open as soon as this year. So yep. I'm not going to confirm or deny anything. <laughs> there was no definite word, but no. I'm going to go ahead and assume that we will see Disaster Dave sooner rather than later. And actually, Adam and I got to see Disaster Dave yeah. behind the scenes. He was behind, you know, he was underneath a big plastic tarp, but it was still pretty cool. It was like, <laughs> yeah, oh, was. man. That's, yeah. that's reliving the old days. Yeah, I'm excited to see him back. And don't get your hopes up about seeing Frank because he's in a landfill yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, he's he's. Uh, they said he was beyond repair. So yeah, so Frank they just is pitched gone. It. Yeah. Which is crazy that they would just throw something like that away. Oh, I would have bought Frank. I would have oh, just put him yeah. in my, my house or heck something. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, so no Frank, but we do get Dave back. Hey, I'll take it. One, yep. It's a win in my book. <laughs> it is. It is, definitely. Well, I think that about wraps up Disaster Transport. Yeah. If you if you have any fond memories of Disaster Transport or anything you want to share with us, make sure you do that in the comments section below. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to our podcast. We appreciate it, and we uh, always enjoy doing this. And we're going to try to you know release these uh, twice a month, so there's much more to come. And yeah, yeah, thanks so much for listening. Check out airtimemisfits.com and we will see you in the next episode.